Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Fred Pitsadny, and I'll be presenting this webinar along with Richard Jarofsky, a focus partner. Uh, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, feel free uh, to take notes during the webinar. However, you should know that we are recording today's session and it will be made available to you within a couple of days. Secondly, we'll be using the Q&A feature today to capture any questions you would like to have answered. Uh, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've set aside some time following the presentation and we'll get to that uh, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Six months ago, the tone and the subject matter for this webinar would have been so different. The focus would have been on planning how to successfully scale the next peak off in the distance. That peak represented the goals for the business. But then, with little warning, everything changed. In the space of a very few short months, the COVID outbreak turned our world upside down. Our choices, our options have become severely limited. Now we all need to act very quickly, act decisively, and respond to changes that come at us just about every day as we move towards the new normal, whatever that becomes. To survive and thrive in today's unsettling and turbulent environment, we all need to rethink how we approach planning, managing, and executing our critical priorities. We need to take the tools that we are familiar with and reshape them to fit the world we now find ourselves in. And how has that world changed? Well, for starters, it shut down. Planes stopped flying. Borders were closed. People returning from abroad were either placed in quarantine or voluntarily into self-isolation. You couldn't go where you wanted to, if you did, you couldn't get back. Buyers couldn't buy. Sellers couldn't sell. Shippers couldn't ship. Makers couldn't make. Every economy, everywhere, took a severe blow to the head. And on top of all of this, we don't know what's coming next. Is there a second wave? Is this still the first? Will there be a vaccine? What about an antiviral? When will it be safe to go back to something we used to call normal? This pandemic is crushing many paradigms. How we make purchases and what we buy. How we do business and who we do it with. How our businesses operate internally. How we communicate with each other. And the list goes on. In the face of this, we need to recognize an important reality. Whoever acts fastest and acts most decisively will set the pace. And to do this, we need to rethink our approach to planning. In fact, to a large degree, we need to rethink how we think and especially how we think about planning. So what are the goals for today? Uh, there are three of them. Uh, which are designed to provide you with a guide or roadmap on how we can adapt, how you can adapt your planning toolkit to today's realities. The overall goal is to introduce the RAD process that we have successfully used with our clients. We'll start by reviewing the underlying key principles that will help keep you move quickly through your planning and execution stages. And we'll introduce to use some very specific tools and techniques that are immensely helpful in today's turbulent and uncertain world. So let's start where RAD came from. The fundamental value proposition for all of our work, and then we'll click, and, and then we'll uh, cover the four principles. The tools and techniques, the how-tos, RADs fit who stands to benefit the most from taking the RAD approach. Every leader, whether of a business unit or a team within, wants the great execution of what matters most. 
Great execution, however, remains elusive as most, in fact, it's been published that 75% still struggle with the execution of not only strategic, but operational and project plans. So where do organizations end up? Often it's in one of these other quadrants. Let's start with the orange quadrant, the poor execution of what matters most. This is where you find leaders with great frustration who keep asking, why are we late? Why we miss the timelines again? Why are there so many errors? Why? Well, you get the idea. The green quadrant, the great execution of the wrong things, often leads to major embarrassment as the leader answers questions like, if we're so great at, at getting things done, why is the competition still eating our lunch? Why we've missed our fundraising goal? You get the idea. I'm sure you've been there. The black zone is that color for a reason. Businesses and their leaders don't last very long. Poor execution of the wrong things is a major reason that the majority of startups never see year two. There are three elements that help leaders take the, their teams to the right top right-hand quadrant. Clarity, alignment, and commitment. Well, of what? For strategy execution, it's clarity, alignment, and commitment to the long-term focus and direction of the business. Today, it's about identifying the critical priorities, what we need to survive, and for some, it is how to deal with unusually big demands for their products and services. The bottom axis is about ensuring clarity, alignment, and commitment to action for individual accountabilities. Not being clear and empowered to take action or to make decisions is, according to published studies and our own 50 plus years of combined experience within 400 organization, the number one blockage to great execution. We'll be addressing how to fix that during the webinar. For the next 30 minutes, first of all, um, if you look at the slide here, uh, uh, rapid, rap Agile deployment really consists of two components. Uh, GEM, which is the great execution of what matters most. Then if you add a good dose of speed and agility, you get rapid agile deployment. For the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna focus on the four principles you can use to catch the wave and not be crushed beneath it. These four principles will be supported by six specific tools and techniques. Let's overview the principles first. First of all, engage your people in the process of planning and deploying your plan and do it early. You know, we've heard a lot of talk about employee engagement over the last decade. Mostly empty words, as most organizations are not really doing a better job at it than they were at the turn of the century. Not when it comes to real meaningful engagement. Quickly means exactly that, quickly. Not months or weeks, days. Power through the execution by doing a few critical processes and doing them right over and over again. Planning sessions should be short bursts, like one or two hours long, not one or two days as we're accustomed to during strat planning. You've all heard the saying, no plan survives the first engagement with the enemy or variations on that theme. Well, it's more than a truism. A plan that fails to address the rapidly changing realities on the ground is worse than useless. It's downright dangerous. Agility and responsiveness will rule. The fourth and final principle Nothing stops a great plan achieving the success it deserves more than the people charged with its execution having only a vague idea of the, of the authority that they have to make decisions and to get important stuff done. We'll cover how to fix that today. So these are the four, four principles. Let's dig into each of them and put some more meat on the bones. 
There are two important reasons to ask your people about their views and their ideas. The first is they want to be asked. They want to feel that someone actually cares about what they think. In their position, wouldn't you? The second reason is they know things you don't, not necessarily because they're smarter, but because they're often closer to the action, closer to the customers, closer with suppliers, closer to competitors. The last thing you want to hear during a debrief, especially of a failed initiative, is, I could have told you that. You never want to hear those words. It only makes sense that if you ask questions, you need to listen to the answers. Nothing turns people off more than taking the trouble to respond to a question only to be totally ignored. Most of us have that experience. It's not real pleasant. This must not happen. It's critical to respond in some fashion throughout the entire process. Ask people early enough in the process to make their input useful. This is during the assessment stage prior to putting pen to paper and creating the plan to take the business forward. This should be one of the very first things you do. There are a variety of tools, many available at low cost, that can be used to gather this input. SurveyMonkey is one, and there are others. Keep it simple. Don't make it too elaborate or complicated. Ask a few questions and make it clear as to why the answers matter. We'll look at a couple of examples in just a moment. Whatever information you gather, it needs to feed into your battle planning. Now, why do we call it battle planning? Well, for us, it conveys a completely different level of intensity than conventional strategic planning. This is, isn't about winning the war. It is about achieving the success we need today that creates a secure and positive tomorrow. The first thing we need to do is quickly come to grips with the situation we find ourselves in particularly in five key areas of importance. First of all, what is life like today for our customers? How are they being affected? How are their attitudes, preferences, and behaviors changing? What new challenges are they having that might represent opportunities for us? Maybe their need for what we do has decreased or perhaps increased due to the present situation. For instance, the dramatic drop in commercial and civil aviation has had a terrible impact on companies that service and repair aircraft components, such as wheels and brakes. Sailmakers, on the other hand, who have the capability, have gained from the surge in demand for covers to protect engines as aircraft sit idle. What about our suppliers? We depend on them to operate our business. So how are they holding up? Do we need to be looking for alternatives? We can't afford to have a supply chain that's unreliable due to capacity constraints. As borders closed, many experienced logistical nightmares and still haven't been able to establish a secure supply of materials and components. As for our competitors, are they showing any signs of weaknesses that we can exploit? Have their service levels dropped significantly? Are they losing customers? Is there a fire sale opportunity out there? Maybe we can snap up some smaller companies that are struggling so that we can expand our reach. If we don't, someone else might. One of our clients, a maker of plumbing products, experienced a huge increase in demand for their products because many of their competitors were either unable to operate or had their supply chains disrupted. Their big challenge, and put this under nice problem to have, was how are we going to make enough of our product quickly enough to take advantage of this windfall? What about our people? I mean, how are they doing? This has been a very stressful time for many, perhaps all. Are we doing what we can to help them through this? 
For example, one of our clients shifted work hours to help those who are having difficulty managing childcare. Finally, we need to appraise our operational capability and capacity. Are we able to meet service level requirements and remain cost efficient? If we have excess capacity, can it be redeployed to other areas? As an example, look at the number of companies making respirators and masks. Remember the survey I mentioned a few moments ago? Well, here are a few of the questions that we ask. What one thing within our power, and I wanna repeat that, what one thing within our power, no, no sense asking questions that we can't do anything about. So what one thing within our power could we do to help you and others deal and cope better? The first thing you need to ask your people is, how can we help you? How about our customers? What can we do to serve them better? After all, a business with, without customers, well, it just isn't. What ideas do you have on how we can bond better with them? Perhaps become the trusted go-to company, maybe even indispensable. We might be suffering operationally and our less than great performance is damaging our reputation and causing frustration. How can we address those concerns and get better? The answers you receive need to be sorted, sifted, collated, organized, analyzed. Look for those nuggets, especially those that might seem at first glance to be a little off the page. Include those nuggets in the conversation you have with your core planning team. Set a very small number of objectives. Richard and I continually work with organizations that create these long, long laundry lists of things to do. Get it down to a very small number of objectives whose achievement will make a significant impact on the business. Make sure that they are clear, clear both in what they are and why they matter. And make sure that they're measurable so you can track your progress towards them. Something like this, increase full order on time shipment rate to 96% by December 31st, okay, it's time bounded, without increasing per unit shipping costs. This objective not only drives increased internal efficiency, it also benefits the customer, it's a win-win. Do it quickly. Lean towards action rather than deep, rather than deep contemplation. We, we, we're guilty of, in planning sessions, doing a lot of thinking as opposed to spending more time in planning sessions on creating action plans. Make, make your planning session short, you know, like maybe one to two hours. 90 minutes is actually a great target and place them in a tight timeline, whatever you can accommodate. Think about doing two or even three sessions in a week during the assessment and planning stages. Keep it simple. You're gonna hear a lot during this presentation about keeping things simple. And it should be your mantra throughout the entire process. A beautiful plan on paper breaks down if people aren't clear on what they need to do and how the various elements fit together to be successful. In a moment, we'll show you some very powerful, sim sim simple but very powerful techniques on ensuring clarity of your plan. The most common cause of execution failure is that people don't know what's expected of them. As simple as that seems, they're not clear on what they're supposed to do or the authority that's available to them. We'll cover more about authority clarification in a few minutes. Complexity is a major barrier when it comes to deciding what to do and then executing it. Richard is going to cover some of the simple yet powerful tools and techniques that you can use. The best thing is that you are likely already have these tools in your toolkit, you're familiar with them. Richard will include how to make the planning and execution roles crystal clear. Richard, over to you. Thanks very much, Fred. Good morning, everyone. Um, Fred's giving you some, some background on RAD, uh, talked about the general approach, talked about how RAD relates to great execution of what matters most. What I wanna do is spend some time now <clears throat> getting into a little bit more detail, kind of opening, opening the hood, if you will, looking underneath and saying, well, what's in there? What does RAD look like? How does it work? 
and that kind of thing. So, so first of all, when we talk about RAD, it's really broken down into a few stages, a few phases. And, and the first of those, like pretty much any planning process is, well, let's get ready. Um, we need to make sure that when we start to do the planning, that we're actually prepared to do it, to be efficient and to do a good job. So at this stage, there are really four things that we do. And one of those is to, is, is to first of all decide on, well, who's gonna be involved? Who is gonna be on the core planning team? Now the idea here, and particularly these days, and especially if the RAD process is gonna be done virtually and online, really important to keep that number down to a pretty small group of folks because it's just easier for them to communicate and work together, especially remotely and virtually. So first things first, let's figure out who's gonna be doing the planning. And then secondly, what employees are we gonna survey? Is it everyone? Is it some slice of the population? If it's a large organization, we might need to segment it somehow. If it's a smaller organization, on the other hand, clients have said to us, you know what, let's give everyone the opportunity to have their voice heard. Well, then we need to distribute the survey. We need to then compile and analyze the results. So the survey window by design is, is very short. So we don't send out a survey and then wait you know, weeks to hear back. Uh, the, the, the window is typically between one and two days. So people are encouraged to respond and to respond quickly. And then the fourth thing that we do is we start to get the core planning team ready. And that includes preparing the pre-work for their initial session of, of getting ready to do the planning itself. This is about five days of activity and, and typically it happens in the week prior to initiation, which is our next phase. So where we start in planning really is on assessment. This is really saying, well, what's going on around us what, and, and also inside the organization that we need to be talking about, we need to be thinking about, we need to be figuring out how, how significant it is, and then what to do about it if those things true, truly are important and should be important to us. So at this stage, there are three major activities and each of them is broken down into a work session. And again, as, said Fred early, or as Fred said earlier, these, dis, these sessions by design are short and close together. But where we start with is looking outside the organization, our customers, our suppliers, and our competitors to understand what's going on out there and how it is affecting us and how we believe it's gonna be affecting us at least over the next little period of time. Then we look inside and you know, we talk about our people, we talk about ourselves operationally, what sorts of issues, concerns, constraints, even opportunities and positive things, because it's not all necessarily all bad stuff, what's going on there. And then finally, out of all of that, both the external and the internal view, which is essentially a SWOT review, SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, is to say, what are the critical few priorities? We might have talked about 100 things. We can't deal with 100 things, nor should we even try to. What are the things that really have to be important to us as we move through the process? Well, this is days one to five of the RAD. So if you figure that a RAD, let's say, started on a Monday, it says that by the end of that week, by the end of Friday, we have completed the assessment looking outside, looking inside, and then distilling that down into, into the critical few priorities. So now at this point, as a planning team, we've got a pretty good finger on the pulse, and we really know what should drive the conversation as we move through the RAD process. Well, now that takes us to planning. And really there are three aspects, three, three activities that take place here. And, and the first of those is to try to come to some real firm conclusions as to what we're trying to accomplish. What are the objectives that we want to accomplish? And these are near horizon. So unlike strategic planning where we might be talking about, you know, goals that are out there two and three years, we're talking about objectives that we want to accomplish within perhaps three months, maybe six months. So it's, it's a very near horizon conversation. Well, once we've figured out what those objectives look like and, and what they are, the next question is, well, what do we need to do in order to actually accomplish them? So what sorts of initiatives do we need to put in place? And again, we might start out with a long list of possibilities, but we need to work that list down to, you know, the one or two or maybe three things that are gonna get executed and executed well in order to be successful. And then for each of those initiatives, who's gonna drive it? Who's gonna be the leader? Who's gonna be essentially accountable for its execution and for achieving its results? 
The third work session then says, great, we've got our initiatives, we've established the leadership. What about resources? You know, maybe we need to apply people to an initiative. Maybe we need to fund it. Maybe we need technology. I don't know what it might be, but again, really important to consider resourcing at that point. Otherwise, we go down a path of implementing an initiative only to encounter a reality, which is that we actually can't do it or do it very well because it's not properly resourced. We also need to establish authority. And you may remember that that was the fourth principle that Fred spoke about earlier. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Well, this is days one to eight. So essentially we're talking about the second week of activity within the RAD process. And now we've got a plan. You know, we've got clear measures of success. We've got objectives, we've got ownership and we've got authority established. So now we are ready to take the plan and deploy it. I just want to touch on a couple of things before I move on. So one of those is the time frame. So we're looking at uh, really two weeks of activity, and that by design is what RAD is meant to fit into. So it is short meetings, they're put close together, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that sort of thing, so that we move through it quickly. Again, rapid, it's part of RAD. Well, there's another aspect to the activity, which is that we also want to be able to do this in a way that allows the members of that team to also do their day job, to, to look after the things that need to be looked after in the business. So we're not taking people away for a day or two or three days. We're taking them away, maybe even in quotes away, for very short periods of time. The other thing is that although the core planning team is only engaged for a couple of hours at a time, there's a lot of background activity that's taking place that we're doing in terms of preparing for those meetings, sifting, sorting, collating information, creating pre-works, updating the planning documents and things like that. So there's a, in fact, a fair amount of activity that takes place, if you will, just off the stage. I wanna turn now to some of the tools and techniques that are really, really critical to RAD, critical to the situations that businesses are finding themselves in today and things that our clients are finding really, really helpful. And the first of those is something that we call the 3W chart. And the 3W chart is a really helpful tool to capture important information. So for instance, important information would include things like, well, what's gonna get done? <laughs> and who's gonna do it and make sure that it gets done? And, and exactly by when? Now that's pretty important information. In fact, in essence, that's the core of the plan itself. So we use the 3W chart to make sure that it's crystal clear <laughs> that everyone knows who needs to know what's gonna get done, who's accountable, and by when it's gonna get done. And sometimes the conversation that the team has leads them to conclude that it's, you know, it's a joint effort. Robin and Tony really need to do that thing together. And so our, our response to that is absolutely they should do it together. However, one person needs to be ultimately accountable. That person is elected, identified, or steps forward and volunteers, and they get the star next to their name. Well, that's a very basic view of the 3W chart, pretty basic information. Some clients say, well, that's great, but there's other stuff that we want to be able to capture and record as well. So for instance, what about resources, right? Who else needs to be involved? What else needs to be applied? Uh, just let's just make sure that we identify that right up front. So again, as I said earlier, we don't go down a path and find out that we're not resourced properly to actually be successful. So that's the 3W chart. Here's another one that clients find very helpful these days, in all days actually. We call them rules of engagement, fits sort of with the motif of, of battle planning, if you will. You could call them ground rules, you could call them rules of order. Essentially, it's, it's ways to manage the dynamics of that core planning team. And given RAD, rapid and agile, and a focus on deployment, uh, there are five that we find extremely helpful and our clients really appreciate. First of those, make your point and do it quickly. Not long conversations, not pages and pages. A paragraph, maybe a sentence or two, Stay, say it, and then let's, let's move on from there. Close is good enough. And you know, recognizes the fact that teams often spend way too much time trying to work things out to the third or fourth decimal point. When it's really not necessary, it, it, it consumes a ton of time and it may not lead them to a better answer than what they had a half an hour ago. So close is good enough. Keeping focus, no sidetracking. Using a parking lot, for instance, to capture things that are important to talk about, but they're not timely. They're not things that we should talk about right now. 
Having one speaker at a time, hugely important when we're doing meetings online virtual, because you've got a meeting with multiple faces on the screen. Um, if more than one person is talking, it's difficult to figure out who that is. Plus, I don't know who I should be listening to, whether I'm on the team, whether I'm facilitating the team. So having one speaker, extremely important. And then finally, the 80% rule. And the 80% rule is similar to number two, but it really focuses on conversations and decision making. It says at some point you reach the point of diminishing returns and you need to recognize that someone needs to say, I believe we're at least 80% there. So can we call it, make the decision, stop the conversation, whatever the case, and move on. Here's another tool that's very helpful these days our clients are making use of, and I'll give you an example in a minute. And we call it spitball decision making. Now spitball, and it's in quotations, um, ha has a couple of definitions, and it's not the one from baseball, which is an illegal pitch. It is rather more along the lines of, let's toss things against the wall and see what sticks. And in fact, I think the little picture in the upper right-hand corner of the screen gives you that impression. Well, here's why we have spitball. We have spitball because no matter what the initiative is, there will, or the objective is, there will be multiple ways that you could go about accomplishing it. Multiple choices, a bunch of initiatives that you could take. The problem is they're not all created equal. I mean, some are better than others. Some honestly don't make any sense. Others are, are counterproductive. So in fact, if you did A and B, they'd cancel each other out, maybe make the, worst of the situation worse. So how do we work it down from a long list to a short list? Well, here's one way of doing it, and this is what we call spitballing. This grid that you see uh, basically is a cost benefit view of looking at options, looking at alternatives and saying, how good are they? And let me describe it briefly. We've got the best deal zone, the green zone. Well, this is something of high value and low cost. And you'd say, why on earth wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't we do that? That sounds like a really good deal. We've got the justifiable zone, and that's where things, they, they've got a fairly high return, but also a pretty high cost. You know, maybe I can justify doing it, especially if there's not a lot over in the green. And I'd say, well, there's not much over there, so we better do our hunting in the blue zone. You've got the why bother zone in the lower left, and these are things that you'd say, well, it's not going to take much effort to do it. On the other hand, it's not going to return us very much either. So. I'll, I'm not sure that we would bother doing those things. And then finally, you've got the no way zone, the orange zone. You, you, those are the things that, that you say, boy, it's gonna cost a lot to do that. And guess what? It's not gonna do much for us. So there's just no way we're gonna bother with it. And of course, in the middle, as is true in life in general, you've got the maybe zone, you've got the gray zone. And those are the things that we're just not sure about where they fall. So maybe they need a little bit of work to kind of push them around and figure out, are they green or blue? Are they yellow or orange? Well, wherever they fall, the idea is to, to take a long list of things and work it down very quickly to a smaller list. And the example I'll give you is a client that was looking at making shop floor improvements. They got a team together, they brainstormed, came up with 130 things that they could do, 130 suggestions. Well, when they looked at the list, they concluded that number one, it's way too long. And number two, there are some probably pretty great ideas on that list. And there are some others there that you'd say, oh my gosh, no, they'd probably fall into the no way zone. So what they did was they spitballed it. They used this grid and they together figured out where things fell. And what happened was they took that 130, they worked it down to a much, much smaller list. They looked at that list and they said, ah, still too many things. We still can't do all of this. So they did a second round of spitballing and then worked it down to a small short list of things that they're executing and implementing. And that's really what it's about, is figuring out what of all those things that we could do, should we do, and then we must do. Well, now that we've figured out what to do, and we're starting to deploy the plan and make things happen, now comes the question of being agile and being responsive to continuing change because things do not stay the same. Well, for one thing, we need to check on our progress and we need to do it often. As part of RAD, we recommend check-ins, short check-ins, might be only five or 10 or 15 minutes long, multiple times during the week, during the deployment phase. 
This allows you to stay on top of things, identify significant issues or concerns, and where necessary shift resources around. Change the plan if it's not working. You know, I, with the, the quote that's attributed to Albert Einstein that doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result is, is the definition of insanity. And, and we've seen examples of that certainly in our day-to-day -day and our business lives. So if something's not working, change it. It may be the wrong thing to do, in which case you'd say, you know what, let's do something else. It might be the right thing to do, but the way that you're doing it isn't right. So you gotta look at that. The third thing to think about is what we call calling an audible. This comes from uh, football. It comes from a North American football. And this is really where, you know, the quarterback in the huddle calls a play, huddle breaks, players go down to the line of scrimmage, they get down, center goes down over the ball, the quarterback looks up over the center, sees how the defense of the other team has been aligned, and concludes that play's not going to get us what we need. In fact, that play might get us into big trouble. So the quarterback calls an audible. So what's an audible? Well, essentially, the quarterback, using coded language, because you know, they, they don't want the other team to know they're changing the play, using coded language tells everyone on the field, we're not doing that play. We're now doing this play. Now, two important things when you call an audible. One, which is maybe obvious, is that everyone needs to hear it. That's why they're yelling it so loud, even in a very loud stadium. The other thing is that everyone on the field needs to know what to change, what I need to do different or differently now than was part of the original play. The fourth principle that Fred mentioned is this idea of delegating authority. And it's such a critical aspect of RAD and of, and of being successful and of being efficient in general. This is about giving people sufficient authority. We often use the term requisite, meaning enough, not too much, not too little. Again, sort of the Goldilocks position somewhere in there. Making sure that we're specific and clear so there are no questions and no doubts as to what the authority is. And then finally, when we're able uh, to give additional authority to people to make them more efficient and more effective and to be able to work more quickly. Well, we use an equation often when we talk about authority and it's this one. It says results without, a, or, or pardon me, responsibility without authority. You wish you had the results. Results in frustration. So in other words, if I'm, if I'm accountable, responsible for doing an initiative, achieving an objective, and I don't have enough authority to, to do it, I'm gonna be frustrated. I'm not likely to be very effective or efficient. And quite honestly, it might jeopardize that outcome. I might not be successful. It could hurt me and it can hurt the business. There's another view of this one, very similar but different, which is that responsibility without authority also results in delays. Because if I don't have enough authority to take action quickly and responsibly to what's going on, I'm constantly having to go and check with my team leader, for instance. Well, those delays are gonna slow things down. And RAD is all about quickness and agility. Well, when we define authority, we use basically four buckets, four levels. And let me describe them very quickly. Level one says, just do it. I don't ask, I don't tell. My team leader says to me, you know what, in this kind of thing, for that kind of stuff, just do it. I, I don't need even to know about it. Level two says, no, no, you go do it. But after you've done it, make sure you tell me. And it's, it, it's a, an obligation, it's not a courtesy. A level three that says, hey, before you do that kind of stuff, you come to me and tell me. I want to know about it before, before you decide or before you act. And then finally, level four, which is to make a suggestion. Now, I think it probably um, helps to, to look at an example of this to make it clear. So here's one for a manager who has to implement uh, changes on the shop floor of a manufacturing organization. There are a few examples to look at here. Here's the first one. Now this person can spend money. It's already been approved. They follow the policies. It's pretty vanilla. It's the level one, you know, just, just do it. Approving new, new suppliers for ongoing operations, on the other hand, gets a level two because my team leader wants to know after I do it. Because if someone else comes to that person and says, hey, what's going on with suppliers? I heard you're making some changes in your department that team leader doesn't need to be embarrassed, doesn't want to be embarrassed, and I, I want to make sure that I'm not doing that. So level two. A level three for things that have minor impact on staff, and then for things that have a significant staff impact, my team leader says to me, you know what, in those cases, 
come to me with a recommendation, a suggestion, say, listen, here's what I think we should do. But as the team leader, I will be the one to decide. And that's what the level four is. Now, these levels, this way of defining authority can be used for projects, for initiatives. It can also be used for even just the day-to-day -day goings on of defining individuals' roles to make sure that if they're accountable for achieving outcomes, they also have the kind of authority that's required to be successful. So that's on defining authority. I'm gonna turn it back now to Fred, who's gonna talk about the rad fit. Fred. Thanks, Richard. So how does RAD fit into today's COVID world? Leaders from all walks of life are feeling pretty frustrated about how fast things are changing. They're worried and often uncertain about what they should be doing and how to do it. They're asking questions like, what are my critical priorities? And what should I be doing about them so that what matters most today gets done and done quickly. And this is exactly what the RAD approach delivers. You know, back to the model that we showed you earlier, when you combine the great execution of what matters most, Gem on the left-hand side, put in a good dose of speed and agility, you get rapid agile deployment. Okay, so for those of you that would like some professional guidance to implement RAD in their organization, here's the cost for a hands-on, step-by-step, let's avoid the landmines facilitation of RAD. For the basic RAD package, which includes, first of all, the survey, the administration, the analysis, and the reporting. Second is for getting your core planning team ready. Next are the six working sessions delivered according to the schedule developed by your core planning team. And then one checkpoint meeting to provide a template to use for subsequent checkpoint meetings. The full no surprises price is 15 to $18,000 plus applicable taxes. This is for a completely virtual process. The $3,000 price range is to accommodate survey administration, which is a function of the number of employees. Okay, it's 11.43, so we have a couple of minutes for some uh, questions and answers. Richard, any to come through? Uh, yeah, Fred, we do have one question, which is, is RAD a replacement for strategic planning or do they, or should they complement each other? Uh, this is a question that we hear very often, and the simple answer is no, RAD is not designed to replace strategic planning, which has a totally different function. Uh, strategic plan typically is about what's going to happen to the organization, what's the mission for, you know, two to three years down the road. Now, RAD, during the process, you might find out something about your situation because we do use a mini SWOT analysis during the RAD approach. And we also through the survey find out a lot about what your people think of the situation. You may discover some things that will influence your long range plan, but it is not designed to replace it at all. There are some techniques that you can use from RAD into strat planning. So for example, you know, the uh, meeting ground rules, the spitball decision making, uh, the three W chart, making sure authorities are clear. They're all very, very valuable and very, very helpful processes that can make your, uh, your strategic planning uh, even more powerful. Anything else come through, Richard? Uh, no, that's it. Just one okay, question today. Good. Well, 11.45, uh, the last thing we're gonna do today is we're gonna ask you to quickly give us some feedback uh, on the three goals that we uh, had established at the beginning of the session. We wanted to introduce the process of RAD to you. We wanted to share some key principles to accelerate your planning execution. And we wanted to introduce some useful tools to you. So Richard's gonna run a little poll. It only takes literally 45 seconds. Hang in with us. We'd really like to get your feedback on it, Richard. Okay, the poll is open.
I'm going to close the poll in about 10 seconds. So if you haven't completed the poll yet, if you could do so, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna wrap things up. Uh, thank you again for your participation. We know you're all very busy people. So on behalf of Richard, myself and the focus management team, uh, thank you very much for taking some time out and spending it with us today and have a great day.